perfect. I see you, Angela. Hello. Can there you hear you me? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, you can hear me? Okay. okay. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not logged in into the app, so I don't know if I'll be able to share my screen. Let it cry. I hear some background noise. Sorry, it's hard to hear you, like rustling of paper. Is Adana or Grant here yet? Not yet. Grant no. was just here a minute ago. Okay. Do you have that open share tray icon at the bottom? Uh, yeah, I've seen it, but it, uh, they have. Oh, there it is. OK, thank you. Yeah, I have it now. And there are helpful many who need change you to the presenter status, so hopefully you're all set now. OK, I am. Thank you. I see it. So maybe just another minute and uh, we will get started. But for those of you already on the line, thank you for sticking with us. We're about to embark on our exciting third session of the day, um, but uh, we will um, join just let a few more people into the lobby and get started. Hi, I was just wondering, we have one more presenter, is that correct? Yes, Lisa Ng. I don't see Lisa Ng. I do see a Felix Ng. So Felix. that's another. Maybe that's issue. yeah. That might be yeah. Her. That's my son's that name, um, and we share this account. But even though I rename the profile to me, it's not showing up as me. But it did in the last meeting. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Did. Is the did right you? presenter in? I'll go ahead and change your yours into a presenter also. Mahalo. And if you could rename me, I'm not sure if you have the ability. Um, please do. Where did it go here? I don't. Unfortunately, I don't think we have that kind of power. <laughs> Make a presenter. Okay, I think we're all good. We're all set. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, welcome back to session three. Hopefully, you folks are enjoying the exciting sessions that have happened so far. And just a reminder, we'll remind you at the end again, but there's a, a, a last speaker at the end after the session. Um, but welcome to Parenting During a Pandemic, creating a webinar series. So I'm the facilitator for this third session. My name is Grant Murata, and we have two moderators helping. Um, Edana Wong and Apilila Atisanoe, and they will be helping to make sure that we get all your answers, your questions answered, and that if you have any issues at all, you can enter it in the chat and we will um, help you as soon as we can. Um, just a couple of notes. Um, thank you again for your grace in technical issues that we have with this conference. We will be continuing to mute folks' mics, so if it accidentally gets unmuted, we will unmute it just so that we can um, hear our presenters a little better. Um, we're also asking if you do have questions that come up in addition to issues, please put it in the chat and we will address them as their time permits in the, during the session today. Please also do not click on the share screen or stop recording. Those would be controlled by the moderators. Um, and if, if, if we've seen it happen so far, if or maybe when you get logged off of the session, no worries, just go back and click and you join us right away. So without any... Further ado, uh, let me introduce our speaker. So Angela Matien from the Hawaii Statewide Family Engagement Center. She's the project lead and TA coordinator at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We also have Dr. Kathleen O'Dell, currently the academic officer for the Kailua Kalehau Complex, where her Kuyan includes working with PCNCs and family engagement centers. And we also have Lisa Ng, who's with the Hawaii Statewide Family Engagement Center as a program director, manager and financial literacy trainer at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So please, um, if you could unmute your video and start us off with a virtual round of applause as we welcome them this afternoon. Thank you all so very much. We're very excited to be here with you this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. 
Um, today is all about sharing the journey that we've taken uh, to meet the needs of our families virtually in this trying time. I'm going to start off and then our, my co-presenters will be joining into the conversation in just a bit. Uh, so uh, how did this all come about? You know, where did we all start with this? So back in May, if you want to go ahead to the next slide there, Angela. Way back in May, when we were trying to figure out the brave new world that we had then entered, um, we tried to think about, you know, how are we going to engage our families virtually? One of my PCNCs actually had posed a question in one of our meetings about, you know, it's really difficult to start relationships with folks now virtually if we haven't already established them. And so that kind of helped me to think about, I really paused and thought, hey, so right, we should definitely be thinking about this. If we don't have relationships already, and even if we do and we need to nurture them, how are we going to do that virtually? And how might we, su how might we support our complex around that? So next slide. So we're going to learn how to support families uh, virtually through a uh, webinar series. And our success criteria for today, we're hoping that out of this, you will gain uh, the ability to identify the needs and interests of families, to meet those needs and interest interests through networking with community organizations and area experts, to orchestrate virtual family engagement through family webinars, and to plan next steps based on the changing needs of our families. Next slide. Thank you. All right, so starting out with Kailua Kalaheo. So we have a very diverse um, population in Kailua Kalaheo complex. So we have Title I schools. We have schools that are 100% free and reduced lunch. We also have a military school in our complex. We have two high schools, and also we have an alternative high school, Lana school is also in our complex. Uh, Hope and Waimanalo sit on a uh, Hawaiian homeland. Uh, we have around 200 and actually it's usually more, it's usually closer to 300, but we've had such issues with getting everyone to be able to fill out the paperwork because we're virtual. Um, students living in homelessness. And we have currently about 153 English language learners, which is also a relatively low number compared to where we were at last year also most likely because it's difficult to make contact right now and get everyone to fill out the necessary paperwork. So we really had to think about, you know, with all of these diverse needs, how are we going to identify those and then how are we going to provide assistance? So <laughs> I was thinking about the wonderful partnership that I had already established or the wonderful connection with the Hawaii Family Statewide Engagement Center. I'd run into these folks several times at uh, different family engagement um, conferences, and I knew that they were extremely, um, extremely helpful and extremely knowledgeable. And we were on the same page about family engagement. And I also knew that they were run out of uh, University of Hawaii. So I knew that they would have quite a few connections to our local area experts through the university. Okay, next slide. So the idea came to have a pan parenting during a pandemic webinar series. And all of these links, you'll see them underlined in our slide deck. The slide deck is provided for for you in the resource folder and so you'll be able to click on any of those links when you access that through that google folder the parenting during a pandemic link there is actually to our website where we house all of the webinar recordings and slide decks that we've done already as well as registration links for any upcoming um, webinars and then you'll see also the second link on this page is to the hawaii statewide family engagement center which i truly hope you take the time to explore because they have a wealth of information on there. So many resources that are so wonderful for the schools to be able to utilize. Next slide. OK, so today we're going to talk about how you identify the needs, how you meet the needs and how we make it work and staying organized. So those are the three pieces we're going to go over and that's the basics. It's, there's quite a few steps in between. Please do not feel like you're getting overwhelmed. We're going to provide you with a toolkit that's also in the Resource Center, and uh, we will be able to help you through all of the steps, but these are the basics. These are the three things you need to think about. How are you going to identify the needs? 
how will you meet the needs, and how will you make it work? Okay. All right, so the step one, as far as how did we get to the place where we knew the needs of our complex? So we actually gathered information from our families through an online survey. I developed a survey to ask the families things like, during this pandemic, what, what are the most challenging aspects around parenting? Uh, and I was hoping to get a few responses, but I got over 200, which was amazing. And not only did they have uh, a lot of needs that they wanted to identify, but they also all, all over 200, took the time to actually type in responses as well to really let us know what was going on and what they were having the most challenges around. So I could tell that, you know, they strongly desired to um, reach out and to work with us to see if we could make those connections to the resources that they might need. So um, then we took a look at all of the data and put it all together and reviewed the results to determine what the top topics were of need for our complex. All right, so this is, and you'll have access to the survey and the resources as well. So you can create your own just by making a copy and modifying as you'd like. Um, but this is the survey that we sent out to the folks and really um, wanted to know like who was responding. And sometimes you fall into more categories. You know, sometimes we have parents who are also teachers, but mainly we had parents and caregivers that were responding. Uh, and then we asked what were the most challenging aspects. We gave them a lift, list of option for workshop topics, but we also left a category in there for other in case there were things that we didn't think of because we didn't want to make the assumption that we knew what people might need or want. Um, in addition, we asked what day and time they prefer, what would work best for our families. And then we asked also if they would like it to be recorded so that they could watch it at their convenience. So these were some of our results. So as you can see, mainly parent and caregivers that were responding to this, a few identified as teachers. Okay, and then we asked uh, the following topics and you can see where the stars are placed. Those were the top three of the greatest need. Now we have been able to actually provide webinars around the majority of these already, but those were the ones that we wanted to start with. We were really thinking about, you know, in this pandemic, things are changing monthly, weekly, daily in many cases, and therefore the needs of families are going to change just as rapidly. So we wanted to make sure that if these were the top things they were identifying in that current moment, that we worked as expeditiously as possible to provide those first, because the families were identifying those as the greatest needs in that moment. All right, so most accessible day and time, we did decide to do um, Friday afternoons. We do them Friday afternoons at two o'clock, which actually worked out really nicely when we came back to school because um, Fridays are the new Wednesdays for our, I, I hear somebody's background noise and you just want to mute. Make sure you're on mute. We're going to grant the help of you. Thank you, super. Uh, so Friday afternoons work out nicely because Friday is the new Wednesday for uh, most of our public schools. So now our faculty meetings usually occur on Fridays. And a lot of these topics were crossing over, like recognizing signs of depression in children and teens, for example. So uh, this gives faculty the um, option of also participating in these webinars because they're Fridays at two o'clock. So we kept it that way throughout the summer and then into the school year. But you will note that 67% there uh, indicated that they would prefer the, re the sessions are recorded. Uh, you know, not everyone is available at two o'clock on an afternoon. They may be working, they may have children running circles around them. So we wanted to make this as accessible as possible to all of our families. So we have asked our presenters and almost all of them have allowed us to record the webinar sessions. And we are finding, um, which I've heard is typical to, to other organizations providing webinars, that we will have about double register uh, uh, than is actually live participating. And so we know that the other half is most likely watching it recorded. So um, we're happy to be able to provide that whenever possible. And I would suggest the same to anyone who is thinking about doing this. 
So what's been the most challenging? This is the responses that we got from them. Motivation and accountability. You know, this was at the time when we first did this, when we had just gone to uh, enrichment, virtual enrichment. And so, you know, at that time, it was an even greater challenge because there was no grading system um, at that time either. So, you know, motivation was even a harder, um, harder one for them. Balancing work time um, and dealing with the kids and then, you know, virtual and screen time, supporting emotional needs. These were all things that they were identifying um, through that survey and that we wanted to provide for. All right, so here comes my partners, uh, the wonderful folks from Hawaii Statewide Family Engagement Center who have uh, completely made this all possible and are tireless in their efforts to support us. So I'll hand it over there, Angela and Lisa. Okay, hi Kat, thank you. Hello everybody, aloha. Um, I'm Angela Matti and as Kat uh, introduced earlier and you know, we, we just have to say, and, and I know it speaks for the entire team in the Hawaii, Hawaii Statewide Family Engagement Center, that um, we really have enjoyed this partnership, um, being able to learn um, from our families, um, also, um, you know, working side by side with Kat and her wonderful team in the Kala, um, Kailu and Kalaheo complex area. Um, but a little bit more about our, our center, um, just in brief, um, we did provide the our website as uh, as Kat, um, Dr. Odell has mentioned that we have a lot of resources, so we do encourage you all to um, check them out and share them with your families. Um, but with the Hawaii Statewide Family Engagement Center, we really focus on building the capacity of our stakeholders. And when we talk about the stakeholders, we're talking about those folks supporting children, right? And the student academic achievement through these partnerships, such as the this webinar that we developed or partnered up with um, Dr. Odell. And so um, we were so excited um, when she reached out to us um, to talk about family engagement and then also um, to, to pivot, right? In this new, um, you know, unprecedented times, right? Because we had a lot of different projects li um, lined up, but like everyone else, you know, the families, educators, professionals had to pivot. So um, this was a really great way to uh, maintain and sustain and really hear about what's going on, you know, within the community and really serve the families and what they wanted um, to explore. And so with that, we were able to um, provide information, resources, and also take what we've learned to um, further adapt um, kind of our approach and services um, for their stakeholders of uh, school, families, and community. And when uh, when Dr. Odell approached us, you know, our first meeting was really talking about what we were experiencing, the conversations that we were having with the stakeholders, right, families and the educators. And so, uh, you know, Dr. Odell uh, really wanted to emphasize how uh, important it was to engage our families, right, and being able to provide them with um, enrichment, um, tools, strategies. And so we were, like she said, we were totally game for that. We really wanted to participate and really leverage the resources um, between our center and between what, you know, what um, what her complex area um, knew about. Um, so what we what was really helpful in this process is doing the needs assessment. You know, we learned that there were topics that the families wanted to learn more about, right, to help them during these unprecedented times. We also learned that families needed a place to be heard, right, and to most importantly network with other families and professionals. And so this space and provided the opportunity for them to do so, um, the opportunity for other families to interact with one another and to build um, relationships on a virtual kind of landscape. So, uh, you know, what we what we had to do was we identified the needs, like Dr. Odell said, and the next phase was to meet those needs. And so together, our team, um, we looked at the survey results and looked at how we can put it into action to meet those needs. And so we had to think about um, how we were going to meet these needs. And most of our planning came up organically. So we're happy um, today to be able to put it in an actual like steps um, because we had many conversations, um, conversations within our team and with other folks and then coming back together. And so we're, he we're here to provide those steps with you so that you're able to start your own series based on the needs of your community, based on the needs of your school. 
And so we what we thought about and what we when we went, went back to look at our meeting notes, you know, we needed to think about how we were going to share this. Uh, what was the uh, format that we were going to use for this virtual virtual meetings and then also um, creating a structure, an agenda so that we can share with our potential um, speakers and that we had consistency and then finding those guest speakers. So it is important to think about the, the method in which you're going to uh, you know, have these virtual meetings. Um, the way that uh, folks are going to access it, making sure that it's easy um, to use, right? And then also that it fits within your budget. And it, you know it, it's a cost effective, and so um, I didn't highlight it here, but I just wanted to mention to all of you that there are um, ways that you can do this. You know, with a limited budget, um, Facebook Live, um, it's free. I know a lot of uh, principals use it as a platform to be able to communicate with families or talk story. Um, Google Hangouts is another one as well. Um, for our team specifically, we went with Zoom because we, we talked about the different platforms we had and so we talked about what we might want to anticipate and um, we used Zoom because our center had an account with them and so we were able to host about 100 to 300 participants knowing that we were reaching out to uh, a complex, right? So we wanted to make sure that we had that space. Um, and of course, um, when we found out that we were meeting those needs and that we could uh, offer this, this opportunity for others, we did open up based on our registrations um, to other folks on neighbor islands um, and to other constituents that we work with. So that was very exciting, but it's important to think about think about that and also think about the information that you will be sharing. So if you're um, specifically doing, you know, webinars uh, for professionals, right, um, you might want to think about the FERPA, right? And so I know that the DOE, they use the WebEx because that fits and aligns with their needs. Um, however, we're targeting families and and we, we saw that it was OK to be able to use Zoom and that it was we will be able to facilitate that conversation. So some of the things you might think of and then also um, um, providing um, tutorials, um, you know, embed links with um, information on how to, um, you know, access the the um, link or access and move the uh, different features around. And so we actually put a sample of what that looks like within the um, kind of virtual to toolkit that you'll have um, access to in the the folder. So it's just some some things you want to want to think about. And so. Um, one of the things that was very, very helpful was um, being able to have a, a structure to to the webinars. And so um, this was something that I mentioned before that we shared with the guest speakers and also for consistency. Um, so I am going to welcome back um, Odell, uh, uh, Dr. Odell to talk a little bit more about this, the, the agenda, um, because she really had a, a good sense of, of what she wanted the experience to be and what families were looking towards too. Thank you so much. So I, I will say that um, we learned as we went. I will definitely say that. This was all new to us and we were definitely like everything else we're doing right now, building the plane while we flew it. So we definitely learned each time we got a little bit better, it got a little bit smoother. Uh, but we tried to stay with a consistency as far as the agenda went, um, just so there was a familiarity for, for our families who were joining us and so that it would run smoothly uh, session to session. So um, I always made a quick slide deck that at the very beginning we would introduce the participants or introduce the speakers and welcome the participants. Um, we would we made, we figured out that we need to have more than one person record because uh, sometimes the recording doesn't download correctly. So that was one of the lessons we learned to make sure that more than one of us was recording at a time. Uh, and then we knew too that we had to provide technical support for the attendees and uh, Lisa, who will also be speaking, was so very good at doing that for us. Um, not only did she provide a Zoom tutorial, but, but then uh, we also did Zoom tri tips and tricks, which I think is on the next slide for you to see. Um, in addition, we made sure that we were monitoring the chat box for questions. Because there was going to be so many people, we had to take into consideration or we discovered that sometimes uh, some questions can derail the speaker and go off on a tangent and whatnot. So um, we recognized that we should have all the questions put in the chat box 
And then Lisa could moderate at the end by asking those questions. And that helped uh, to not interrupt the flow of the presentation itself, since we only had an hour uh, to get through the presentation and so many participants. Uh, and then we had the extra 10 to 15 minutes after for questioning for as long as participants could stay or, or, or would wanting to stay. Um, so that question and answer again was at the end. Uh, we did also learn that it's best to um, go ahead and do your share your feedback survey before the questions and answering starts because that may go a little bit longer and some folks may not have scheduled for that and have to leave. So we learned to go ahead and go on there and say, OK, and we're going to move on to question answering. But before that, here's the survey, if you don't mind taking the, it and then we'll talk about also like the upcoming speakers after that and then we'll go to question and answering so we don't have to worry so much about losing people. OK. And then on the next slide here, this is the Zoom tips and tricks that we learned that we needed to go over, especially when this was first starting and all of us were trying to figure out all these online platforms. I think families are getting better and better at this because in their own jobs and with their children, they're, they're having to learn all these platforms like we are. But especially at the beginning, we really wanted to um, help them to be able to navigate the basics of Zoom so that this would be an accessible platform for them for these webinars. Uh, and that included letting them know that we were recording when we were in case they didn't want to be on camera and wanted to turn their videos off. So we were very mindful of their privacy also uh, in the same way that Lisa actually named herself Q&A in the question box. Um, and they could ask questions just to her instead of everyone in case perhaps they were shy or hesitant or didn't want to self-identify themselves in those questions. Then Lisa could ask them anonymously at the end. So that was super helpful. OK, and I'll give it back to Angela. All right, and then I guess I'll, I'll give it to Lisa. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> no worries. No worries. All right, thank you for having me today. So one of the important things we had to um, wrap our heads around was how do we connect with the correct and appropriate guest speakers and who's going to reach out to them? So as we met with the team, we took into, into some considerations such as it would be really helpful if we, after we identified our speakers, send them an invitation email to give them a little bit of background on what we're requesting of them, as well as sharing the results of that survey and our potential thoughts of you know, how they can contribute and add value to our webinar. And we also had to figure out a dedicated person who's going to be communicating with the pre and post webinar communication tasks um, with the speakers. Uh, you know, as a lot of us are, you know, juggling um, a lot and wearing many hats, we didn't have um, one person who could dedicate their full job to doing this. So we had to delegate that out clearly ahead of time so that we didn't end up confusing our presenters. And um, one of our really great tips that we learned is to schedule a debrief meeting after the first webinar that you have to identify areas of improvement. And this is not a debrief meeting with your presenter necessarily, um, but with within your team. Um, but some of our presenters were really happy to share their uh, feedback with us via email um, immediately after the session. Um, I'm happy to say that it was all very positive. Um, next slide, please. So continuing, um, we had to consider uh, the communication for what's going to happen before the webinar. And so in that email, that introduction email, we asked if we could schedule a meeting with them if they were interested in um, pursuing uh, being a presenter with us. And then we would answer their questions about the needs assessment results and determine the learning outcomes because a lot of the times we're not the 100% expert in the area. We have a breadth of knowledge not the depth of knowledge. And during this pre-meeting, we learned from our experts that, oh, this is very important and a lot of things that we weren't aware of. And because they're working with families as well, they were able to add um, learning outcomes that we wouldn't have expected and that eventually our families ended up finding extremely useful. Uh, we also remembered that we need to email the comp and confirm the date and time and the checklist of things that we need from them if they were to pursue um, being our presenter. For example, we wanted to be able to promote their bio, have a wonderful picture of them. And because our families did ask um, for recordings because it's more convenient to them, we did ask the presenters if it was OK to record. Some were hesitant, some were said absolutely not because of the sensitive topics that they were presenting about, um, but they did uh, uh, agree to share resources um, with everybody. 
Uh, we also asked if we could get a presentation title based on you know where the conversation went and a description of their their presentation. A lot of times uh, people you work with might have their own um, reporting requirements. Um, sometimes they have to justify their time as to why they're not doing their regular job and doing this thing with you. So um, it's great to co-construct a brief survey um, with the presenter to see if there's anything that they need to know or report on. And also it gives you insight to some of the questions that really um, matter to families, like how useful was this to you? Um, and last but not least, you want to offer tech support for your guest speaker uh, prior to the event. So that was my role on the team. And I, what we worked out was um, I asked them to log on 15 minutes um, early before the presentation over Zoom, and I would pr make sure that they could share their screen, share their video, um, and if they were doing video, if their sound worked, and I would walk them through that process. Um, after the webinar, uh, you want to make sure you send a thank you to your presenters, um, as well as thinking about um, your your attendees, right? Thank you, thanking them for attending. And then with your presenters, you proceed with any next steps. For example, um, for those of you who've created presentations last minute, it happens to a lot of us. Sometimes we got this the slides, you know, a little bit after the presentation versus before the presentation. Perfectly cool. Um, everyone's busy, so just sending a, a gentle reminder um, worked out really well for this, well for us. And also about a week later, because we want to give families some time to respond, um, everyone's busy, uh, we would share the survey results with the speaker. Next slide, please. Um, so I see a question in the chat box. Do you folks have any suggestions of guest speakers or can you share with us some people you've asked in the past? Um, yeah, we can definitely share that with you. Um, I'll be posting the link um, to the PDP one webinar series page and you can see all the guest speakers that we approached. They all agreed, so they're they're all there. And um, if you need to, you can email us uh, hfec at hawaii.edu with questions and uh, we can try to work with you uh, later on about that. And I might just jump in, Lisa, if you don't mind for a moment. Uh, two of our speakers were actually school psychologists from our Windward District. So uh, there, uh, you don't have to look too far in many cases. Thanks, Kat. And so another thing to think about is how do you know who's on your webinar? It's very useful to know who's going to be there. Um, so as a courtesy to our presenter and as well as our team, um, I executed a poll at the very beginning of the, um, just before the presenter presented. So that way we could see like I'm a parent, I am an educator, I'm an administrator, I'm a service provider. And that'll help, um, you know, prepare your presentation team of, you know, what to expect and um, how to answer questions. And we also had a webinar feedback survey that we shared at the end. And it, this is an example of um, a link that was shared um, at, during one of our um, webinars. And it's great to share your, your link right after the presenter is done presenting, but before the Q&A session, because families are busy. When it comes to the end of the presentation, some of them are just going to be out. So if you really need to capture any data or, um, or their opinions, because they matter, put that survey link just at the very end of the presentation and then move on with your Q&A session. Another good thing is um, for us, we stopped recording or providing a, record, a recording of the Q&A session to allow that anonymity of our families who are asking very personal questions and sharing very personal information. So, um, next. And because it was an iterative process, like Kathleen mentioned, and we were doing everything all at once, uh, we did our best to timeline the events uh, or logistics for you. And um, I'll let you take a moment to read this, but it all started off with a pre-meeting, um, and then we had a pre email, which is um, pre before the event email that we sent to the presenters. And then we had uh, we co constructed feedback in our surveys. A lot of these. Um, the fourth step was, you know, tech support meeting that happened sometimes a few days before the actual webinar, depending on the presenters availability. Sometimes it happened right before the session. Then immediately after the session, we would clean up a lot of our, um, our files, get everything ready, and we would send um, our mahalos. 
to our wonderful presenters and provide them all this other feedback. Um, and number six, we'd share feedback survey results um, about a week later. So try to be present. You know, um, I would often work a little bit later on the days we had the sessions to make sure the recordings worked, edit the video and get it ready because there's so many families that might sign up for your webinar, but they might not attend live, but they sign up because they want to know, uh, get an email about when your um, update is available, when the resource is there. Um, so uh, being mindful of that and preparing your presenters that, you know, we have X amount of people registered, but um, keep in mind that not everyone does attend because a lot of them value the recording. Um, doesn't hurt the presenter's ego when they see that only a, a fraction sometimes of the registrants do attend. Okay, um, next slide please, and I'll hand it over to Kat. Hi, okay. So thank you very much. And I think the one other thing that I would put in there, Lisa, and Lisa, by the way, has been fantastic at keeping me organized. I think it's very important that when you're working with a team, <laughs> you play off people's strengths. And Lisa's is definitely to be organized and detailed, uh, which is not necessarily my strength. So that worked out very well for us. The other thing that we did figure out after the first or second session is that it's a good idea to send that survey link out um, again with an email uh, for those who are watching it recorded. They can still take that survey link. We still do, do need to know um, how it impacted them and what they might want to see in the future. So we wanted to make sure that those folks who watched it, the recorded version also had the opportunity to take that survey. So that was fantastic that we were able to, to figure that out sooner than later. Um, so then we had to think about really how we were going to promote the webinars. How are we going to get the word out? Um, so several things that we did to be able to promote this. Um, within the DOE, within the Department of Education, we send out uh, memos. So I made a flyer for each one and sent out a memo to go along with it. Um, <laughs> thank you, Angela. Uh, and we sent that out to our schools, but specifically to our PCNCs. I work with the PCNCs in our complex and we have a good network established. Um, we do quarterly family engagement meetings and we include not only schools with PCNCs, but each school um, who does not have a PCNC sends a representative who we call their family engagement lead. So I already had that network established. Um, and they had their means at each of the schools to then advertise the flyers that I was sending to them. So that worked out very smoothly. I would say that whatever school system you are working within, whatever complex you're working within, that you make sure that you have a reliable contact who is a part of uh, communicating with families at each of the schools. Um, so you have a fast, easy way to disseminate that information. Uh, then we created, I created a website just using Google Slides or uh, Google Sites, which is so very simple actually. If I can do it, anyone can. And that'll be what you have the link to to click on. And uh, that was a place where we could then house all of our webinars and the recordings and the resources. And of course, also keep registration links. And we assigned a, a easy bit.ly to that. So it was easy to find, easy to remember. Uh, let's see. And then um, we also uh, sent it out. I sent it out in our, we have an equity e-newsletter that we put out monthly to the whole complex with resources for teachers and staff. So we were advertising it in there as well. Oh, and then we have a Google shared folder, um, which we'll be talking a little bit more about for our team to keep everything organized for ourselves. OK, so yes, this is the bit.ly for the the website that uh, was created, and so it's easy to find and easy to find all of the resources. And like was mentioned earlier, you um, you are welcome to contact any of the speakers on there. I'm sure that, you know, <laughs> if they are not able to assist you, that they are good contacts for signing someone who is. And like I said, a couple of them you will actually notice are um, actually employees of the DOE who work within our district. So that was a great um, avenue for us as well. So OK, let's see what I didn't cover on here. Nope, that's good. Oh, and I created the presentation slides, which we talked about before, too, that we used for each one of them. Uh, you can also utilize social media. So the Family Engagement Center helped us with this one as well, because they have actually their own Facebook page, too, that they could advertise on. And then many of our schools have Facebook and or Instagram pages. And so they were uh, putting it up on theirs as well. So that was fantastic. And I just have to say that when 
we didn't start at the very beginning because we were still getting you know used to our own accounts and whatnot um, on Facebook and Instagram, Twitter. But once we started posting them, we started to see an increase. So um, so I know it's kind of scary. It was scary for me, um, but you just have to kind of mess around with it and kind of troubleshoot or you know connect with uh, maybe someone that's familiar with it. Um, a really nice way to you know stay connected with someone else. But we did see an increase in that. And I do think having a flyer that is easily shareable yes. helps. Mm -hmm. And then for some of my PCNCs, I sent the flyer, but I'd also send the actual links mm -hmm. or the verbiage that they might attach to an email to go with it to make it as easy as possible for them to share it. Mm -hmm. And so um, Dr. Odell mentioned before that we stayed organized through a Google shared folder, which was really nice. And so we had it, we had our team and we kept organized by storing our files templates, reports, presentation slides, recordings. And um, if you do partner up with, um, you know, someone that is working, you know, off a grant like we are, you know, these these uh, reports are very important. So it was really nice to keep organized and for us to go back and reference this information to be able to report out to share, you know, the work that we're doing in the partnership. Um, it was a great way to come up with a way to keep, um, keep us kind of uh, familiar to, you know, what our structure was in terms of presenting or the template and then um, also, you know, for folks, you know, if somebody wasn't um, feeling well or wasn't able to, you know, step in, any one of us could step in actually um, because we were familiar and we had a place, a shared place um, for us to keep all of our wonderful, wonderful resources. Um, but, you know, nowadays, you know, folks are already have a lot of different ways, Dropbox, um, other ways that, you know, uh, Microsoft Teams. And so, you know, finding the way that's the most suitable um, for your team to share and access uh, these files. And even so more so that we're not together in office now, you know, we are all actually spread out <laughs> across Oahu. Um, so that was very, very helpful. And um, the great thing is that we're able to actually provide these resources for you, these templates, um, as tools for you in this virtual kind of uh, uh, webinar toolkit for you all to use. So, um, so this was another really great, I guess, benefit for this. And just kind of uh, to give you kind of breakdown, because I know whenever I'm trying to organize stuff, I um, want to get like kind of a outline of how I could, you know, organize everything. And so this is kind of how we created our folders and what we put in those folders. And again, we actually simulated the same type of setup within the, the virtual or that electronic toolkit that you'll be able to access in the folder. Right, and I'll turn it back to Kat. Okay, so benefits of a partnership is probably my favorite thing to talk about with within this topic because I have learned so much about the benefits of partnering. Um, you know, it's allowed us to get what we wanted to get done uh, quickly, efficiently, effectively. Uh, one of the most important things throughout this whole process uh, was the understanding that if you want to create relationships and nurture relationships with families, when you ask them what it is they need, you need to respond quickly and make those connections to really build that trust. So having these systems in place and having partners to work with um, enables you to, in real time, uh, help people to solve their problems and help them to, you know, get that social networking piece where they have opportunities to speak to others about what's going on, especially when they're feeling so very isolated during this pandemic. So, uh, you know, the, the Hawaii Statewide Family Engagement Center folks um, have been wonderful. And throughout our discussions, I've learned so much about their work and seen so many other possibilities for work that we're doing going forth in different areas, which was been, has been fantastic. In addition, the partnerships that we've made with our speakers, uh, the conversations that we've had with them have been so rich and so informative. Like we know a, a few things about motivating children to learn or signs of depression in teens and adults. But through those conversations, so many things that we hadn't thought of they were like, oh, that totally makes sense. Now I'm understanding that, yes, we should be talking about that as well. I have learned through those partnerships so much about um, different areas of needs for my families in my complex. Um, I think that the families are feeling a greater sense of partnership with the schools and with the complex and with the engagement center. Uh, I think that they are feeling more supportive. I think um, from what we're hearing back, you know, they're looking forward to these Friday webinars and to seeing folks and to participating in discussions. 
Um, we've really been able to leverage local resources and our local area experts, which do exist. It's just a matter of really working together. Uh, and then, you know, the family, the toolkit that we're, we've created is going to be so helpful to you. And it's so nice because we don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. We want to be able to help each other and support each other in our work. Um, and this has been a way where we could pilot, you know, what we've been doing here in my complex. And then hopefully other complexes can replicate this in the future by using this toolkit so we can reach even more people. Okay, so what are we looking forward to moving forward now? So um, we, we acknowledge that things are changing, as I said, all the time. So we are surveying our families, not only each time, and the, these surveys have some of the basic questions are quite similar so that we can collect and correlate the data. Um, and then we add in unique questions that that speaker may need as well. So we're looking longitudinally across the data about how everything's going and the needs and if they're changing for folks. But then we've also just sent out another survey now that we're at the beginning of this semester um, to really see where we're at again to inform our planning going forth. So you really want to make sure that you're being as flexible and as reflexive as possible to stay current with the needs of your families. Find out what those needs are in the immediate and uh, do your best to respond as quickly as possible to find those resources and experts for them. Um, so we hope to continue our webinars as we go throughout the year, but uh, it will definitely be changing as we go. So we're not planning too far in ahead, uh, too far in ahead because that would be um, counterintuitive to the idea that you want to be providing real-time assistance to families. Um, we're looking forward to working with our PCN Season I Complex, talking about scaling this down now for schools. So that means, you know, we took a look at the whole complex and the needs of everyone combined, but we know that each school is their own community within itself and they each school is unique in the needs that they might have. So I'm talking to the PCNCs now on our family engagement leads about how might we scale that down? How would that look if you surveyed your school families? What does your school need? And then hopefully from that, if you're providing um, these webinars, parent education, parent resource opportunities, um, you can maybe even break that off into smaller groups who would like to continue the discussion around any one topic, which would allow for a deeper dive and also for the opportunity for that really social networking and connection with other parents within that school community. Um, so, and of course, I'm very much looking forward to continuing to work with the Statewide Family Engagement Center um, because that, you know, that is just my joy because they're wonderful and they have all kinds of wonderful ideas and, and I love our discussions and our plans and I see great things for our future together. Thank you. Next one, Angela. And I'll give this to you. Yes. And this one is the, the um, uh, what we were talking about, this uh, family engagement kind of webinar toolkit. We really like, you know, Dr. Odessa, we really want to make sure this is possible, you know, within all the different communities, whatever, you know, size you want to have it and whatever, who you decide to bring in. Um, but we wanted to provide you with a checklist, kind of a quick checklist of what to think of and to help you with your first initial meeting with your planning team or work group around this. Um, the templates, um, we have just a couple um, templates for the emails. We have the template of the survey that you can go ahead and modify um, for your own right, um, for your own particular community. And then just any other type of um, tracking forms or anything to keep your your group, your team, um, you know, organized. We really wanted to make sure that you had all of that. And so um, you do have access uh, within that folder um, with the uh, Kamehameha Schools, um, I guess the Ohana Engagement Conference um, segment, if you will. I believe they'll send that out all to you folks um, uh, in a few days or um, after this, this session. Um, but yeah, really, so please do share this with other folks, take advantage of this mm -hmm. of, um, and uh, yeah, enjoy. And so with that, uh, you know, this is the end of our presentation. We'll have some time to talk story, tip chat, share our experience. Um, like 
Dr. Odell said, this has been such an amazing, an amazing experience on so many different levels. Um, and mainly um, for me, that relationship and building that um, knowledge to be able to better support a specific community. And so um, it is it is a pleasure to see all the work that uh, the Kailua and Kalaheo complex is doing. And um, we're really excited about the uh, family resource centers as well. So that's kind of continuing our conversation around that and how we can better, better help and serve the families. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. Uh, so I, I think we have a little bit of time for question and answers, if I'm correct. Are there any questions that came up in the chat box? Yes. I did see some, yeah. Um, so one I saw was, what was the most difficult, challenging aspect of creating a webinar series? Um, was there anything that was a surprise, good or bad, during this process? Most for me, staying organized is always the most difficult. <laughs> so I think that it's it's definitely good to have a team if you can, even if, for example, you're a PCNC and I and you might want to do it at your school, but how can I do it on my own? Are there a, a couple of other PCNCs maybe that might want to collaborate with you? I think it's good to play off people's strengths. I think it's good to have always at least one more set of eyes on everything that you're putting out because, you know, the people are always catching my spelling errors or you know this link doesn't link or you know definitely helpful to have more than one person trying to do this for sure so for me that's the most challenging i know angela and lisa would you say anything otherwise i i would just say i was nervous you know the very couple sessions that we had in the tech but um, you know, just like Dr. Dell said, if if you you know you you got to go in and you have to, you know, trial and error, trial and error, and then just learning from it and just moving forward um, with your team. So I think after you know the first the first few that we had, I think we had a, um, a system, a routine set, and it was really I think. Uh, very it went smoothly after that you know we all had um, specific roles that we actually like naturally played into and so um it, you know it's it's fun it's been really fun but only the tech so just making out you know nervous but other than that it was it's been really great yeah that was a learning curve as well yes. i saw someone ask in the chat box let's see um where was it? Oh, what was the most requested topic? You know, it was really interesting because um, one of the most requested topics was something that you wouldn't have necessarily thought of. Uh, it was parenting strong-willed children, which which I thought was, was you know, <laughs> it's kind of ironic because really, um, are the children actually strong-willed or, or is it that we have to spend that much time together at home <laughs> and try and motivate them to learn, right? So I think that even children who are not necessarily viewed by their families as strong-willed were uh, now being viewed as such. So um, sometimes you have to figure out ways to um, name the presentations or around the discussions around something that sounds positive, you know, something to the effect of, you know, positive discipline or <laughs> when you know that, that what they mean is just, you know, how am I going to manage my kids? Managing kids. So you, you want to think about that a little bit as well. But definitely that was a big one, you know. And then, of course, people were, were nervous about the depression issues too. Like what is just norm, normal Zoom fatigue and sadness and, you know, not being able to be active and what is actually bordering on depression? When should I start to worry? And and then what should I do? So that one was one that came up quite a lot. Um, yeah, but I'm looking forward to see what's going to come up with this next survey, really. I did see um, kind of comment about, you know, looking at the uh, survey, you know, and your feedback. And I have to say it, that is one, I think, element that families appreciate is having their feedback and their input um, being considered and taken, you know, seriously. And I think when we're talking about family engagement and that as a strategy and for us as a center is how important that feedback is. And so, um, you know, when you do address, you know, the concerns or the topics that they're interested about, families feel cared for. They feel like they've been heard and they feel um, honored. So um, when we looked at this approach and we looked at, um, you know, what our, our center believes in in terms of the philosophy, we knew that um, that this was going to be a space that was going to allow families to feel feel this warmth, feel cared for and feel valued during this really hard and difficult time. Um, so so yes, you know, anytime you, you are 
um, doing any events or planning events and particularly for families, it is important to get their feedback. And and you'll see that you will have a, a good turnout. You'll have families invested because um, because you are, are listening to them. Mm-hmm. I agree. And I think that another benefit is really the more you work with at the complex level, the more we work with our schools and our PCNCs, the more we're showing them that we value family engagement and the work that they do and that we are able to support them and work together with them. And I think that's huge as well. And there was another a comment here about if this was um, the webinars were open to any parents or windward um, parents. I think that's initially what we wanted, though, was it was because we didn't know how big this was going yeah. to be. We wanted to be able to accommodate and um, be able to support because the family, the, the, the folks and the families that, that took the survey were in the the um, Ka, um, Kailua and Kalaheo complex. So we wanted to make sure that priority was given, you know, to, to that um, that community. However, we did open up um, several of the right. I would say several of the webinars. Oh, yeah. At the beginning, we weren't widely advertising because we were about how many people we could take because the Zoom platform only allowed for so many. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we did want to make sure we were servicing the complex and those who we asked. Um, But then as we saw, about half of them are watching it recorded. So it allowed for more space. Mm -hmm. So then it was like, why not? Why not open it up to more people and the more people we could reach, the more children we can serve? Absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. But there again, if you're trying to do this at a school level, I would say that uh, if the intent is to create a sense of community within your school Mm -hmm. and you want parents to build relationships with each other within the school, then I might limit it to just that school and try it like that. Um, So for us, that wasn't the intent. There wasn't a lot of interactive talking going on in our webinars. It was just straight question and answer at the end. so that wasn't necessarily a consideration for us. It was more just uh, meeting the identified needs mm-hmm. of the children mm-hmm. and the families. So if you navigate so our website and you go to um, follow us on like join our Facebook or on Instagram, you can find out about anything that we're doing that's public. Um, it'll all be there. So just-